trust that was a, a, a clap for Scott. <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't heard what I've got to say yet. <laughs> no, um, I trust it's a sign of good things to come and thank you for inviting me to be a part of your time together for today and for the coming couple of days as well. I must say it's a great privilege, it's a great honour to be able to, to share with you and I hope um, it's an enjoyable and informative experience as we spend some time both today and tomorrow grappling with the book of Jonah and I guess reflecting on what it has to say to us who are working in various forms of pastoral ministry, various uh, pastoral contexts. Okay, so I'm honoured and privileged to be here. Thank you for your um, invitation. I'm also really glad that I've got a, a nice clear <laughs> clock at the background. Um, I'm used to lecturing for three hour blocks, so um, I, I promise I won't put you through that. We'll just do it in, in an hour pieces here and there. Now when Scott first called me up and asked if I would be willing to speak with you, initially he asked if I would be willing to speak on the book of Jonah. And I must admit I was a little bit reluctant at his initial request. One of my areas of focus, is that booming a little bit? Okay, cool. One of my areas of focus as a lecturer is the Old Testament prophets. I teach um, general introduction to the Old Testament, but I also teach two advanced Old Testament classes, one looking at the Pentateuch and the other looking at the prophets. Um, so I have had a bit of time working through and struggling with these books, and my book on interpreting the prophets will be for sale later on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to get that early. Um, but Jonah is just so different from all of the other prophetic books. See, the majority of the prophetic books are filled with prophetic oracles. You know, those sayings that begin with, thus says the Lord, or something like, the word of the Lord came to me. And they contain relatively little narrative sections about the prophet. So in other words, they tell us about a lot about what the prophet had to say, but they actually tell us relatively little about what the prophet did, or who in fact the prophet was. So for example, when I teach my Old Testament prophets course, I focus on the book of Amos. Now you may be aware that the book of Amos has nine chapters in it, but it only contains one short, very short, in fact about uh, seven or so verses, story about the prophet. And you find that in chapter seven. It's got one short narrative, and that's actually quite exceptional in terms of at least the minor prophets. We don't hear all that much about who they were and what they did. We largely hear what they had to say. And in Jonah, of course, the reverse is true. The book is basically a narrative about the prophet and his journey to Nineveh, and there's only one prophetic oracle in the entire book, and that runs for a grand total of five words in Hebrew. And so because Jonah, therefore, is not really a good representative example of an Old Testament prophetic book, I don't actually focus on it all that much in the subject that I teach. So, I nicely, I think, uh, suggested to Scott that perhaps could I focus on Amos instead. You know, I was wanting to do that thing, which I'm sure you, you lecturers, or so you uh, preachers never do. I was wanting to kind of recycle some of my <laughs> <laughs> pre-existing material. Um, and I think he took it back graciously to the committee, um, and they said that that would be fine with them, that I could speak on Amos if I would like. Sorry, I could speak on Amos if I would like. But after I had that conversation, I was doing some thinking about the conversation, also about the lecture series, and I couldn't get the idea of Jonah out of my mind. And as I had conversations with a number of people in preparation for our time together, you know, I increasingly came to the realisation that it was probably going to be more something like Jonah and not Amos that would actually really speak to the situations and needs of this group. So 
So you see, Jonah, all four chapters of it, is perhaps the best book in the Old Testament, if not the best book in the Bible as a whole, for reflecting on the nature of the pastoral vocation. It helps us struggle with issues such as what does it mean to be a pastor or a Christian leader? How do we face the challenges that we're going to encounter? And how do we go about embracing the opportunities and costs that our calling will bring? <coughs> and so it's a wonderful text to gather around as a group of pastors, as a group of preachers and Christian leaders. Hopefully it will help to clarify some of our convictions that we may already hold. Um, hopefully it may challenge some of the pre-existing ideas or conceptions that we have. So through all that process, I quickly clarified one thing in my own thinking, and that is that Scott and his group are much better in terms of hearing from the Holy Spirit than I. <laughs> so with that in mind, I say thank you to Scott for pushing me outside of my comfort zone, and I really appreciated the opportunity that I've had over the last couple of months to struggle with this book in particular, something that I hadn't really focused on previously. And I hope, therefore, it will be a great opportunity for you as well to kind of struggle with and to learn from this text. Now, before we get things underway, I think it's probably important to clarify what I hope to achieve through these four or so lectures, to kind of talk about my goals, my purposes um, for um, this series. And as I've been preparing these lectures, I've kind of had two images in my mind, and I couldn't settle on one, they both kind of work, so I've put both of them up, um, up there on the PowerPoint. But I've had this image either of a triangle or three circles. And what this suggests to me is that these lectures are going to have three key foci, as it were. Now, some lectures may skew more towards one corner, or they may be located more in one circle than another. But I'm going to hope you appreciate that even if I do skew towards one side, all of those three, three things are actually intrinsically related. And therefore, even though I may be focusing on one, it's actually going to be informing how we consider the other two areas anyway. <coughs> so, by theological, what I mean is that I'm going to focus on the theology of the book of Jonah, and I'm talking their theology in a narrow sense. Okay, So, what in particular does this book reveal about the nature of the God whom we worship? So that's one what does this book tell us about the nature of the God whom we worship? The second is I've got a pastoral foci or a pastoral dimension. And here the question for me is how might this book inform our thinking regarding the nature and challenges of the pastoral vocation? Okay. So what does it tell us about the God whom we worship? And what does it tell us about the nature and challenges of the pastoral vocation that we are engaged in? And then I've also got the spiritual dimension or the spiritual corner. Um, it's probably important to clarify what I mean by that because spiritual gets used in a number of different ways in, in different contexts. Um, but here my key question is how might this text speak to the inner life of pastors? Okay. So the three kind of key issues, what does this reveal about the God whom we worship? What does this reveal about the nature and challenges of the pastoral vocation? And how might this text speak to the inner life of pastors? As you can see, they're all three related dimensions, but we can kind of pull them apart to some extent. And so just around that spirituality side of things, um, just again to help you kind of understand what I'm talking about, um, at Tabor, we have a postgraduate ministry program, and that's divided into a number of different streams. Um, one of the streams is called ministry practice, okay? And that's actually our most popular stream. It focuses on the doing of ministry, okay? And so the subjects that we tend to teach in that stream uh, around preaching, apologetics, mentoring, evangelism, those kinds of things, okay? The other main stream within the postgraduate ministry awards, though, 
is called spirituality and formation for ministry. Okay? And so for me, this focuses on the being of ministry. Okay? And it's concerned with the pastor's own spiritual growth, their development, their well-being. For these lectures, I'm going to be focusing on that latter dimension. Okay? Spirituality and formation for ministry. How might this shape the way we be as ministers? How might it feed into our own growth, our development, our well-being as pastors. Now I realise that this is a little dangerous and that I may in fact fail miserably. I may not hit any of those targets and I may miss the pastoral and perhaps the spiritual side of things as well. Why do I say that? Well by training I am a biblical scholar and so some would say that I'm perhaps better off just sticking to, to telling you what the text says. Okay. You know, what the author was on about. And to leave it up to you to figure out how you might apply this to your context or how you might apply this to your own situation. You know, as I said before, I've had a few conversations with various people um, in preparations for these lectures. And one of the most fortunate to sit down with... Um, one of my previous students, and I was picking his brains for a, you know, for needs of the group and what I might talk about. And he was talking about an experience, which I'm sure is not uncommon. I'm sure you've experienced that as well. Um, sitting in a in a lecture, which was being a, led by an academic, which was really interesting. But then the academic started to try to apply what they were saying to the real life. So <laughs> you kind of grow up where you've grown because. Uh, Let's face it, academics have a bit of a, a reputation for living in an ivory tower that we don't actually get out of the world <laughs> all that much. Um, and so that's, I guess, a danger that I'm, I'm going to have to kind of wrestle with. Um, that as lecturers, as, a, as a, a biblical scholar, I guess we can get a little bit detached from you know, the everyday world, the everyday needs of um, pastors and ministers in, in Christ's church. So perhaps I should just stick to what the text says. Okay. Now I actually believe there is a lot of wisdom in that advice. Okay. I think we should play to our strengths. The church is the body of Christ and that means that there is people with different skills, different abilities, different giftings, different ministries and we shouldn't necessarily feel like we need to do everything. Nevertheless, I'm going to ignore the advice, okay? I'm going to ignore the general wisdom, and the key element of these lectures will be focusing on the pastoral and the spiritual dimensions of the text. You're probably aware of the well-known proverb, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> well, guess what? You may be seeing a fool over today and tomorrow. Um, but at least you might get a sermon illustration out of it or something like that. Okay, so that's why um, one reason why this is a bit dangerous, that by training I'm a biblical scholar, okay? The second reason why it's potentially dangerous is that I myself am not a pastor, nor do I have significant pastoral experience, okay? Against that though, I do think, I do hope that I have some capacity to speak into this area. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and about my story. Some of you may know the Blackwood Church of Christ. Um, some of you have had in my classes. So some of you might know a little bit about me, but there's probably some elements that I've kept hidden away. Um, some of you won't know me at all. And so I think it's probably helpful for me to clarify a little bit about where I'm coming from, and that will help to set a context for um, the next couple of lectures. I was born in the heady days of the late 1970s. It was a time following the release of Star Wars, but before the world, nay the universe, shattering events of Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Kiss, Blondie and Village People were at the top of the music charts. I like to think of it as a pure time before the excess and garishness of the 1980s. I was welcomed into the world by loving parents. My mum was and is a child and youth health nurse, and my father had just started training for ministry with the United Church. 
They, of course, gave me my name, Aaron. They also gave me my middle name, Jonathan. And so they are the ones who are totally uh, to blame for me ending up as an Old Testament lecturer. <laughs> so I've either got them to thank or to blame for them, I'm not too sure. <coughs> By the mid-1980s, my dad had finished his training and he took up his, per his first parish ministry at Victor Harbour. Uh, in his parish, he was responsible for two churches. He had a church at Port Elliot, but he also had the large church which has got a, um, a campsite in, which you may have been to, it's the Adair Church, the Adair Church. That's where I was. So I grew up as a pastor's kid in a pastor's house in a pretty, what I think would be typical mainline church. After about six years or so, my father was approached by the Air Force and he was asked if he would like to become an Air Force chaplain. And this was actually a really good fit for my father because prior to candidating for the ministry, he'd actually been in the army. He'd gone through his own troop and he was a captain and he had, was responsible for the um, supply um, side of things. Um, because it was a good fit, he said yes. And then we spent the next nine years or so living at Edinburgh Air Force Base out north. And we regularly, religiously, Worshipped at the small chapel on the base. And it's Mark here, Mark Butler. Oh, I don't know how much I've had a chance to, to talk with him, but um, I know he's shared some stories about his experiences at, at the chapel, the small chapel there. Um, I found this to be a wonderful experience. There was only one chapel on the base. Um, I don't know what the Catholics did, I don't know if they did anything, but the Protestants would get together and we would just hold one service as a combined Protestant. Gathering. So when people ask me about my denominational background, it's kind of confused because even though I was raised in the family of a United Church minister, I was also highly influenced by a number of Anglican ministers during that time on the Air Force Base, and I also had a couple of key experiences in Pentecostal churches. Am I allowed to say that here, or is that, is that, is that all right? Okay. Anyway, uh, perhaps there's a little wonder I've ended up at Tabor, a place like Tabor, which is multi-denominational, and where it's multi-denominational, multi-denomination is, is central to its identity, it's part of its core, it's part of its, its DNA. Now when Dad left the Air Force, I was still living at home, and we moved back to Victor Harbour to plant an independent church. So growing up, I was involved indirectly in three distinct ministry contexts at a relatively large, well-established church on the south coast. At a small, the Air Force Chapel probably had about 35 or so people gathering each week. But at a small but spiritually dynamic congregation on the Air Force base. And as a third at a church plant, which started out with probably three key families. I was responsible for leading worship most weeks and which grew to a maximum of about 50 or so people. After I married and left home, yes, note the order, <laughs> I did it in the good old traditional way, <laughs> um, my wife and I attended a couple of different churches, including a vineyard church, a Baptist church, and now I've reached my home, I've arrived, I worship at Blackwood Church of Christ. My level of participation in these churches has varied, largely depending on my family commitments, but I've always tried to make myself available where I have been. <coughs> now, work-wise, I entered theological studies straight out of school, um, which is <laughs> funny now because I see the, the 17 and the 18-year-olds coming out of school and I think, my goodness, they are so young. Anyway, I did um, and I thought at the end of my studies that I'd enter into pastoral ministry of some sort. That was the reason why I went to table, was to, to be trained and be equipped to eventually become a minister. Now, I completed a, a Bachelor of Theology, and then I also did a graduate diploma of ministry to prepare me for this. But when I finished the graduate diploma in ministry, I was unsure about my future directions, and so for a variety of reasons, I actually chose to pursue further academic study. 
I completed my honours year at Adelaide College of Divinity and then went on to complete a PhD through Flinders University focusing on the Old Testament. In my final year of my PhD, I started lecturing at Tabor, and it's a bit like the Hotel California. Once, once you leave, you kind of, <laughs> sorry, once you arrive, you never leave. So I've kind of been there now for about 10 years or so. And I've got to say those first couple of years were exceedingly challenging not least of which was because I was probably the youngest person in the classroom sometimes. But no, I was certainly younger than the vast majority of people that I was um, lecturing to. But they were good Christians. Mark was one of my early students and they were very gracious and they were very forgiving. And they, um, they were very positive. So as I said before, I'm just about to finish my 10th year at table. And I've held a couple of different positions. My current role is as the head of the School of Ministry, Theology and Culture. And this role brings me into constant interaction with church pastors and denominational <coughs> leaders. It's why I actually have to, much against my will, I actually have to occasionally get in contact with Greg Elsberg and have a chat with him. Never look forward to those conversations. He occasionally answers my emails. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great to be with you, um, Greg. So, but I, I get to meet and to spend some time with church pastors and denominational leaders, and I'm also, I guess, involved in training that next generation of people who are going to be responsible for, for ministry um, in some form. And believe it or not, but most lecturers, or at least most of the lecturers that I know and deal with, do not sit in ivory towers all day. We do not sit around the fire reading volumes from Bart's church dogmatics. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not just what we do. We are passionately concerned with the church, with the state of the church, and with wanting to prepare and equip people for service in the church. So although I don't have any kind of direct, I guess, first-hand experience of what's involved in pastoring on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, wrongly, rightly, I hope, that I've got a bit of an idea of what this might involve. But, please come up, at, please feel free to come up at the end of the, class, the lectures, and if I've missed the mark completely, let me know. <laughs> uh, I would love to hear it. Okay, that's to kind of give you a context of where I'm coming from, what I'm hoping to do, and also a bit of my background. So, the book of Jonah, which is why we're here. Um, before we do this, like any academic, I just want to acknowledge my sources for these lectures. Um, the key source, the key conversation partner that I've really had in terms of my preparation, uh, has been Eugene Peterson. Um, Peterson has written a book called Under the Unpredictable Plant, which is an exploration in vocational holiness. And in that book, he seeks to engage with the book of Jonah and how it may shape the lives of ministers who, especially, I guess, for him, working in the North American context, and therefore it is a little bit foreign from, from what's happening here. But nevertheless, there are still resonances for um, ministers, I think, here in Australia. <coughs> so that's Eugene Peterson, Under the Unpredictable Plant. Um, his key thesis is that the Jonah story is sharply evocative of the vocational experiences of pastors. I'll repeat that. The Jonah story is sharply evocative of the vocational experiences of pastors. And so he thinks that through this text we can learn and can grow and become richer and more authentic and faithful in our past and ministry. I'd encourage you to read his book. <coughs> um, if you're not into reading, I say that to my students and then I kind of think, well, actually, if you're studying, you should be into reading. <laughs> so, but maybe you're not into reading. If you're not into reading, um, what you can actually do is jump on YouTube and put in Eugene Peterson Jonah and that will bring up a series of four lectures that he delivered that actually form the basis for that book. 
Okay, so um, there's a couple of times in preparations that I've had those videos going while I've been washing the dishes as no, at night. Um, just interesting to kind of to work through some of these um, these things. Um, I'm sure if you're familiar with his work, either if you read under the Unpredictable Club or if you've seen um, his videos, you're going to hear his influence in. As we gather around your word over today and into tomorrow, we're conscious of the way that this is not a dead uh, historical word, but this is a living and a breathing word, a word through which you continue to speak to your people around the world today. So Lord, as we struggle with this word, which in some ways is a foreign and a a challenging word. Lord, we pray that we will be open to hearing your voice, to being moved by your words, and to considering ways in which we can go about being your people, your leaders, in ways which are authentic, in ways which are faithful to the ministry context and the places you Pray this in the name. Amen. Okay. So the book of Jonah, if you've got the book in front of you, you know, if you've got your Bibles or books. The weirdest thing that ever happened to me as a lecturer was um, not the weirdest, but it was about three years ago, and I had a student in my class and he had his mobile phone open and he just kept on looking through it. And it was you know, every five minutes he was going to his phone. And I just thought, mate, like, you've got an SMS, surely you can just wait to the break and you can get back to it afterwards. And I'd actually made a kind of decision in my mind, this is kind of getting beyond the joke, you know, it's kind of disrupting the people around him. I was going to go up and have a chat with him during the break. And I went up and had a conversation with him during the break saying, you know, what, what's going on? Is everything all right? And you seem to be looking at your mobile phone a lot. And he said, yeah, I'm looking at the Bible. Because <laughs> he had that as an app, of course, on his phone. Uh, it's a good thing I didn't, uh, didn't call him out on the spot. But um, if you've got the text there, open it up. We'll, um, we'll have it. We'll need it. Okay. Now, the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is one of the literary masterpieces of the Bible. It's a wonderfully provocative and uh, engaging text. The re and I think it's a classic within the Bible. There is a couple of just definitions of what makes classic literature. One of the definitions of classic literature is that everyone knows it, everyone thinks it's important, but nobody ever actually reads it. <laughs> and so the label classic often gets applied to the Bible. Okay? Everyone thinks it's important. Everyone thinks they should read it, but no one actually does. Um, the other thing that I think defines a classic is that a text that engages both children and adults alike. Okay? So in this sense, let's say something like the books of Narnia are classics. Harry Potter is a classic. And I think also the book of Jonah is a classic because it has a capacity to engage both children and adults alike. So who doesn't know the dramatic story of Jonah's attempt to escape from God's presence by boarding a ship bound for Tarshish, only to be thwarted by a raging storm and swallowed by a giant fish. But our Sunday school, dare I say it, our infantile fascination with the episode with the fish actually creates problems. You see, the story with the fish, or the fish element of the Jonah book, is actually only a really small element within a much larger, much more amazing story. And when we focus on the fish element as if this is what the book is all about, 
we actually miss the bigger picture of God's word to us in and through this text. So for these four lectures, my goal is to take us through the book as a whole, and I'm actually going to tend to focus on chapters 1, 3, and 4, meaning that I'm largely going to skip over chapter 2, which is really the whole being inside the belly of the fish and Jonah's prayers kind of emerges out of that experience. So I want to talk about it, but it's not going to be the focus. I want to focus on the book as a whole, and in particular chapters 1, 3, and 4. For the first lecture, I'm only going to cover the first three verses of the book. Okay. Let's read through the text. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Now it's not clear in most English translations, and it's certainly not clear in the translation that I just read from, which is the NRSV. But the book of Jonah actually begins with a conjunction. It begins with the Hebrew word and. Now, this is a little strange. Books, English books, Hebrew books, don't usually begin with the word and. What does this suggest if it begins with an and? What does that imply? There's something that's happening before us, that's right. That this is actually part of a narrative or a story that is already in progress. And in fact, we do find this same opening phrase, the word of the Lord came to a prophet. Okay? That's not unique to Jonah. We do find that elsewhere in the Old Testament. Elsewhere, though, it serves as the introduction to an episode which is part of an ongoing narrative. Okay? So it is. We find that phrase appearing elsewhere as part of a, an ongoing story. Only here... Do we actually find it at the beginning of the book? Most narratives don't usually begin with and. Okay? Typically, narratives begin with the narrator setting up the world. And what they commonly do is that they introduce readers to three things. They introduce readers to the key characters. They introduce readers to the key location, and they introduce the reader to the time at which the narrative is taking place. Okay, that's a typical beginning to a story, not true for all, but typically narratives begin with those three elements: characters, the location, and the geographical, oh sorry, and the chronological setting when the events are taking place. So in other words, the narrator usually tells us when and where the events but not here. We simply began with, and the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The effect of this, I think, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, is to emphasise the way in which the word of God blasts into Jonah's life. It is a disruptive, it is an abrupt, it is a jarring word. It is a disorientating word. It is a challenging word to Jonah. It appears out of nowhere and blasts into his life. There's a little quote there from Young Jonah. Yahweh's word comes without warning and it launches, a, uh, uh, sorry, it launches Jonah on a journey he has never anticipated. So, out of nowhere, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. 
And so the Lord instructs Jonah to go to Nineveh, to cry against the city, for the wickedness of the city has come up before the Lord. And what does Jonah do? Like any good prophet, he resists the call, because that's what prophets actually do for a little while. He resists the call. And then he boards a ship and he heads in the opposite direction. I've got there roughly on a map, Nineveh, located to the northeast of Israel. Where would we put it? Modern day? Sorry, Nineveh we're talking about? Modern day? Iraq, that's right. Okay. It's actually just outside Mosul, which we've probably heard or seen in the past when we're reporting. Okay. Tarshish, we're not exactly sure where that's located, but I guess the best guess is that it's located probably somewhere in modern day Spain, certainly located to the west of uh, Israel. So Jonah flees basically in the opposite direction from where he is meant to go. Now I think a key question we need to address when working through this section is why does Jonah decide to disobey the word of the Lord and travel to Tarshish? Why does he do that? I want to propose multiple considerations because I think Jonah's motivations are mixed. I don't think we can actually identify one reason and say that is why he doesn't go to Nineveh. Okay. When you think about the serious decisions that you make in your life, and I'm thinking here about, for instance, decision to buy a house, decision to get married, decision to, um, to have children, you'll usually be able to identify perhaps a major reason for that decision, but there will be lots of other factors that actually contribute towards you making that decision. Okay. So likewise, I want to argue that there is mixed motivations for Jonah's fleeing to Tarshish. Yeah? There may be a major, there may be more important reasons, but there's actually multiple dimensions at work. And I think that's important that we consider these interesting these dimensions because I actually think they've got uh, interesting points of resonance for those people who are engaged in pastoral leadership today. <laughs> so the first reason why he may have decided not to go to Nineveh but flee to Tarshish <coughs> was that he was actually scared of travelling to Nineveh. Okay. He was scared of the direction of God's call. He was intimidated by the reputation and by the size of Nineveh. And he's actually got a really good reason to be scared of Nineveh. Two empires dominated Israel's world during the pre-exilic period. One of those empires had held them in captivity for 400 years, and it was Egypt. The other empire was Assyria. Now, if we go back to this map here, we actually see the problem for Israel. And if you can understand Israel's geography, you actually can... It, helps immensely to understand Israel's history. Um, Israel is actually located in what we call a land bridge between Africa and Egypt in the south and the great empires of Mesopotamia between the two rivers um, to the northeast. Because of Israel's location, it is constantly subject to the influences of those two powers. We either have Egypt moving um, northwards, coming to attack the Mesopotamian empires, or we have the Mesopotamian empires from the north coming southwards and trying to attack Egypt. Poor little Israel is stuck in the middle between those two things um, and is very much an insignificant figure in comparison to those two great world empires. Now the Assyrians were responsible for the destruction of the Northern Kingdom in 721 BC. They would also leave their mark on the Southern Kingdom, Judah. In 701 BC, King Sennacherib comes through and he virtually destroys all of the most significant cities of the Southern Kingdom. 
The only one that remains is Jerusalem, that holds out, but virtually all of the other large centres <coughs> here destroys. The Assyrian military success was largely due to two factors. The first was that they had a superb military organisation. The Assyrians and the Babylonians were not like the Israelites in the sense that the Assyrians and the Babylonians had a large standing army. Okay? A large standing army that was almost constantly engaged in warfare, that was well equipped and well trained. Okay? That's not like Israel, which has very much of an ad hoc defence force, probably more in some senses more of a militia for a lot of its history that gets pulled together when it's needed. Assyria, though, has a tremendously strong army that have superb military organisation. And that left their mark on the land. There's this massive sea ramp that they built just outside Lachish, which is at the key centre in Judah, which just points to their tremendous organisation, the tremendous ability that they had to carry out warfare. Um, so their success was due to the fact that they had superb military organisation, but they also used psychological warfare very well. Um, they would win a fight if they had to get into a fight, but they'd actually probably try to avoid fighting in the first place. You know, they weren't done. They tried to avoid it if it were possible. And so they often engage in psychological warfare as a means of disheartening or uh, scaring off their potential opponents. Um, and so that might include atrocities against civilian popul uh, populations. Uh, it might include flailing and dismembering their opponents. It was simply a means to dishearten um, their opponents. So I don't know if you can see that much up there. That is some of their, uh, some of the reliefs from Assyria. You'll see in the top one at the back, three people impaled on stakes outside the captured city. Here you can't see it very well. This is actually from a series of reliefs that is in the British Museum, called the, the Lachish Reliefs, so it's probably a, goes about the length of this wall. Um, I don't know how well you can see it, but that's actually a Syrian soldiers basically ripping the skin off um, people that they had taken captive. Actually, people from Judah. Here's a quote from one of the Assyrian emperors. I flayed the skin from as many nobles as had rebelled against me, and draped their skins over the pile of corpses. I cut off the heads of their fighters and built with them a tower before their city. I burned their adolescent boys and girls. I captured many troops alive. I cut off, the, I cut off of some of their arms and hands. I cut off the eyes, their noses, ears, and extremities. Um, which may be a nice way there of speaking about their genitals. Um, I gouged out the eyes of many troops. I made one pile of the living and one of the heads. I hung their heads on trees around the city. Is it surprising that Jonah doesn't particularly want to go to Nineveh, one of the key cities in Assyria? I don't necessarily think it is. I think he's probably terrified by the Assyrians and their reputation. Okay. So, why doesn't he go? Well, he's probably scared of travelling to Nineveh. He's probably also intimidated by the size of Nineveh. Nineveh wasn't the capital of the Assyrian Empire during this period, okay. but it was one of the three key royal cities. And it would have been an absolutely buzzing metropolis. Certainly much larger and much more busy than any place that Jonah had ever been. The city is described in Jonah 3 verse 3. If you've got your Bibles there, you may just want to turn. 3 verse 3. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across I think we've got to be aware that there's probably a bit of a degree of exaggeration going on here. Three days walk across. How far do we walk in a day, roughly? 
We don't have any walking here. <laughs> anyway. About 120 metres. <laughs> scary when you put those pedometers on you and you actually find out how little walking you do. Well, if you walk um, for eight hours, you should walk about 40 miles. About 40 miles. <laughs> in eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 40 miles. I, I was working on a much more conservative figure of about 20 kilometers, but yeah, you're right. Probably. You should walk at five miles an hour. Oh, yeah. So, 40 miles, let's say 50, 20 to 50 kilometers somewhere in between, okay? We times that over three days, the diameter of the city is, what's he saying there, 60, 150 kilometres, whatever it may be. Um, this would have made, the, say the city is 60 kilometres wide. That would have been absolutely massive. According to Wikipedia, um, you meant to laugh when I quote Wikipedia. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, Adelaide stretches 20 kilometres from the coast to the foothills. Okay? Um, and 60 kilometres from the city centre would take you to about Mount Compass in the south, or if you're heading out north, it'd be somewhere between Roseworthy or Freely. Okay. Some scholars therefore suggest that we read the text differently, and so instead of referring to three days' walk being the diameter of the city, that actually talks about the circumference of But if we look at 7th century Assyrian records, if we look at the archaeological remains, the city probably reached a maximum circumference of about 12 kilometres. And that would have made the width or the diameter of the city about 4 kilometres. Okay. Did you realise you're going to be getting a mass lesson? <laughs> um, about 4 kilometres. Still, that would have been very large by ancient standards. Jerusalem, to give you some idea, was probably about 1.5 <laughs> kilometres at its widest. And Jerusalem, in terms of its total size, is 10 times larger than the next largest city in Judah. Okay? Judah, so Jerusalem, which is by far the largest city in Judah, is about 1.5 kilometres wide. Nineveh is about 4 kilometres wide. Three times the size. In chapter 4, verse 11, we're told that the size of the population was, does anyone know, can we remember, population of Nineveh, how many people? 120,000 people. Probably this is also an exaggeration. Modern archaeological surveys and estimates put the population closer to about the 50 to 60,000. But even so, this was a massive city for the ancient world, okay? Jerusalem at its peak probably had about 10 to 12,000 people in it, roughly the size of Victor Harbour or so, okay? If Nineveh is 50 to 60, it is five times the size of Jerusalem. Nineveh, three times the size, five times the population of Jerusalem. This is a massive, bustling place, a place that would have intimidated a country boy like Jonah. And so Jonah decides not to go to Nineveh. The first reason I'm suggesting is because he is scared of the direction of God's call. The second reason is that he is intimidated by the direction of God's call. I think those two things have interesting resonances for us today. Are there times when we, to be honest, are scared of fulfilling God's call to his place on our lives? Are we intimid intimidated by perhaps the reputation of the people to whom we are called to minister? Are we scared by the size of the problem we are called to, to address? Are we... <coughs> concerned about the difficulties that we are going to face when we go out? Are we put off by the size of the problem that we may be encountering? If so, you're certainly not the first person. So why does it go to Nineveh, that Jonah decide to go to Nineveh? 
perhaps because he's scared of the direction of God's call, where he is calling him to go to, he's intimidated by the problems and challenges that he is going to face. Okay. <coughs> the second reason why I think he may be concerned is that it's actually antagonistic towards God's call. Perhaps the reason he doesn't want to go to Nineveh is because he just doesn't actually agree with what God wants him to do. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he is scared that if he does go, the people will repent and they will be spared by God. He is scared that his mission might be successful and he doesn't want to be successful. He doesn't want the people to repent. He doesn't want the people to be spared. Now, this is a key reason that is highlighted later in the book. If you have a look at chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, this is talking about Jonah's response to Nineveh being spared by the Lord. What's his response? This was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He knew that this was likely. He knew that this was a possibility. That because of God's gracious nature, if the people repent, the Lord will spare them. And Jonah actually doesn't want a part of that. Jonah wants the people to be destroyed. There's a quote from Phyllis Trimble. Whereas some prophets shrank from preaching because they saw no hope, Jonah refuses because he knows there is hope. Whereas some prophets complained about the wrath of Yahweh, Jonah protests the love of God. He knows that if he goes to Nineveh, if he preaches, there is a chance the Ninevites might be saved, and he doesn't want this to come to pass. He is antagonistic towards God's call. <coughs> so why doesn't Jonah want the Ninevites to be saved? Why doesn't he want God to show them in his, um, show them his love? The short answer, I think, is that he doesn't like the Ninevites. He may well hate the Ninevites. He probably wants the Ninevites to be destroyed. We can have a bit of a look at the book of Nahum. Nahum probably gives us a picture of what the average Israelite thought about an Assyrian, thought about what someone uh, who lived in Nineveh was like. Nahum is set probably sometime shortly before the fall of Nineveh, in 612 BC. Um, so that would put up after the narrative of Jonah is set. The narrative of Jonah is set in the 8th century, may have been written. But I think Nahum still gives us a pretty good picture of what was common sentiment about the series and about Nineveh. Let's see how he describes the city in chapter 3. So here he is launching an oracle against the city of Nineveh. Ah, city of bloodshed, bloodshed, utterly deceitful, full of booty, no end to the plunder. And then verse 4. Because of the countless debaucheries of the prostitute, gracefully alluring, mistress of sorcery, who enslaves nations through her debaucheries and peoples through her sorcery. And then we're down in verse 19. There is no one a sage in your hurt. Your word, your wound is mortal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For who has ever escaped your endless cruelty? I think there we kind of get a bit of a picture of what an Israelite would have thought about when they heard Nineveh. These are not people that they necessarily like. These, in fact, are people who they may well hate. These 
the people who are responsible for the destruction of the northern kingdoms. And so Nineveh has a reputation for violence and oppression, and in some ways was a symbol of all that opposed God and God's people. One of the commentators I was reading said he kind of likened Jonah going to Nineveh as a Jew who had survived the Holocaust being asked to go to Germany and proclaim a message there. So Jonah, I think, disagrees with God's call. He's antagonistic towards God's call. He doesn't want Nineveh to be saved. He wants it to be God's <coughs> group. So are there times when we don't like or agree with God's call? Are there times when we, deep down, know that we should be doing something or saying something, but we actually don't want to do it or say it? We don't want something to come about. Where we try to resist it, where we try to work against it. Perhaps we're comfortable in our churches, perhaps we're comfortable going about our pastoral businesses, Perhaps I'm comfortable sitting in my office writing my books and preparing my lectures. Perhaps I don't want to be taken out of my comfort zone. Perhaps I'm antagonistic to what God is calling me, the direction that he is calling me. And so we resist. When told to go, we say no. And again, we are not the first to do this. So, I'll finish up with the third reason and we'll come back and look at some of the other ones in the next lecture. First reason why he didn't flee, he didn't go to Nineveh was perhaps because he was scared, intimidated by the city. Second reason, he's antagonistic towards God's call. These two reasons may help to explain why he didn't go to Nineveh. But why then does he choose to go to Tarshish? Okay? He could go to anywhere in the world if he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. Why does he single out Tarshish in particular? And so my third suggestion is it's actually drawn by Tarshish. So I think there is actually a push-pull dynamic in Jonah's actions. On one level, he is pushed away by Nineveh. On another level, he is actually pulled towards Tarshish. So what do we know about Tarshish? Tarshish was a seaport which was located to the west of Israel. Most scholars identify it with Tartusus, which is roughly here in modern-day Spain. Tarsus was a colony which had been established by the Phoenicians, who were the great traders of the ancient Mediterranean world, and it was kind of located almost on the outer edge of the then known world. It was certainly probably as far as any Israelite knew about. Tarsus was kind of like, that's the end of the world. But more important than its precise location was Tarsus's orientation and its association. As I said already, Tarshish is located to the west, and so it's in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He wants to flee, so he goes in the opposite direction from God's call. Tarshish, though, was also a distant and exotic location. It wasn't just in the opposite direction, it was a long way give you some idea, the journey from Joppa to Tarshish is approximately three and a half to four thousand kilometres. Okay. And because trading ships had to make a number of stops along the way, they were picking up and they were dropping off goods, it has been estimated that that journey, which we've got kind of on the diagram, could have taken as much as a year. But this journey was well worth the time and the trouble because of the city's precious metals and because of the exotic trade items that came through Tarshish. So for example, in 1 Kings 
10, the narrator describes how Solomon had a fleet of Tarshish ships, which fetched gold, silver, ivory, monkeys, and peacocks. Cyrus Gordon, one of the preeminent Semiticists of the 20th century, suggests that in the popular imagination, Tarshish had become a distant paradise. Peterson likens it to Shangri-La. Tarshish was exotic. Tarshish was adventure. Tarshish had the appeal of the unknown. Perhaps, therefore, we can start to see the attraction. Perhaps we can see how we might be attempted to turn our back on our calling and pursue that which is unknown, exotic, and inviting. This exotic escapism can be tremendously alluring. Did I say exotic and not erotic? <laughs> That's good. Exotic escapism. <laughs> well, that sentence actually works if you put a rock in it. <laughs> Exotic escapism can be tremendously alluring, especially if we are leaving a church where the finances are tight, the congregation constantly demanding and unappreciative, and there is just that one elder whose God-given tasks seems to be to give you a pain in the back. <coughs> Surely they don't have those other problems in Tarshish. But I think if you're honest, you know they do. And so we may choose to turn our back on God's calling because there is the potential, there is the hint of something better elsewhere, something better out there. There may be some limitations <coughs> that draw us. So, why does Jonah flee? Why does he travel to Tarshish? Perhaps he's scared of traveling to Tarshish. Perhaps he's intimidated by the direction of God's calling. Perhaps he's antagonistic towards God's calling. He doesn't agree with what God is asking him to do. And perhaps he is caught by the allure of the foreign, the exotic, the different. And so he seeks to pursue that. <coughs> having to deal with any issues with people in his own hometown. And now, 